Good morning, I'm Dave Lighty, and we're gonna talk just a little bit about my beef operation today. We've been raising Holsteins and uh, dairy beef for about 15 years. The, uh, the cattle business is really, um, I guess you'd call it a part-time or secondary occupation for us. Um, my main job is in sales. I uh, graduated from the University of Illinois with an animal science degree. So I spend most of my time really on farm visiting with other producers, both beef and dairy, uh, formulating diets, problem solving, that sort of stuff. Just figuring out how to make cow's milk better, how to make beef steers grow better. For us, uh, at least in this part of Southern Illinois, um, typically you can buy Holstein steers, Holstein feeder calves at a more economical price than you can beef feeder calves. That's the reason why we feed Holsteins instead of beef steers. Uh, so that's the good part about it. The bad part is, is that Holsteins have a thinner hide. They have a higher feed conversion. So you need to put them in a good barn. You know, if, if you put a Holstein steer outside in Southern Illinois, especially in the winter months, uh, you're gonna have a problem with a uh, low average daily gain, high feed conversion, higher death loss. So you really need to make sure that they've got a good place to live. So that, that's really the reason why we chose to put cattle indoors. So some of the benefits that I see to feeding cattle indoors, uh, there's a couple ways you can look at this. Let, let's first talk about an animal welfare standpoint. Uh, in the summertime when it's hot, um, in a barn like this, the cattle are always in the shade. You know, so when it's hot in the June, and July, and August months, uh, the cattle are in the shade all day long. Uh, the ventilation in a, in a Summit Monoslope barn is tremendous. Uh, whenever you've got a 26 foot tall opening in the front and a 16 foot tall opening in the back, you know, you're channeling a large volume of air, moving it down to a small one, and you're gonna get some airflow. So even the days that it's still outside, there is a, 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 some air movement on the inside of the barn. So the cattle are comfortable inside the barn and that's just the right thing to do. You know, you're in charge from an animal welfare standpoint to do the best job that you can to take care of those cattle because it's the right thing to do. You, you want them to gain the best that they can. You want them to be the most profitable and the way that they're gonna do that is when they're the most well taken care of that they can possibly be. So that's rule number one. Secondly, from, a, from an environmental issue, um, manure getting into groundwater is a bad thing and, and the better job we do at preventing that, the more environmentally friendly we are, the more you can look at your neighbors who may or may not have been in favor of a new building being built you know, right across the road from them. They can come and look at it and see, look at this, we, we take care of our manure, we don't have any runoff issues, um, we're just doing a good job. So, so I think from an environmental standpoint, whenever you catch all the rainwater and, and get it away from the manure, uh, it makes the manure much easier to handle and then you can obviously spread it when you need to, not when you have to. Uh, so, so those are a couple of the reasons that we really liked about the Monoslope facility. You know, whenever I go onto the, a lot of the farms that I visit and you see vented trust buildings, especially in the winter time where cattle are combined, you see drip marks on the purlins, you see ventilation issues, you see you know, tin that gets rusty too soon because there's too much condensation up on the top. So, so that was really the reason why we, we decided to go with a monoslope barn. Why do we decided to go with the Summit barn compared to some of the local builders is they just have a better design from a ventilation standpoint. Getting back to some of those same things, you, even when you look at monoslope buildings built by local builders, uh, they don't ventilate as well because there's drip marks in the purlins. You can see moisture inside those barns in the wintertime and, and you don't see that in Summit Barns. So that's really one of the main reasons why I decided to go with the Summit Barn compared to the others was the ventilation. One of the, one of the key, I guess, deciding points on which way we decided to go on the, on the size of the building, you know, trying to keep under 299 animal units on the farm was the, the amount of manure storage that you've got to have here in Illinois. Uh, if you're over 299, animal units, you've got to have 180 days worth of storage. Uh, that significantly increases the length of the barn, it significantly increases the cost of the barn. Uh, you know, that manure storage is not part of the barn that makes any money. You, you can't put cattle in it, so, so that, that, that was a deterring factor for us also. So when we can stay underneath 299 animal units instead of 180 days worth of storage in this building, we can get by with 60 days worth of storage. So, so that, that was a big part of it from a financial standpoint. Really, it's a planning thing more than anything, just to make sure that you've got either some acres set aside, pasture ground, or, or you know, five or 10 acres set aside somewhere where you didn't plant corn or beans in, that you've got a spot to go in the summertime with that soupy manure so you don't find yourself uh, in a hard spot where, where you don't have any place to go with your manure. Some of the things that we, we also talk about a lot uh, from a profitability standpoint on feeding cattle indoors is um, how much more feed efficient cattle can be, you know, fed inside compared to out. 
So whenever I run projections for customers that I work with, when I run projections on cattle that I own myself, uh, you want to buy calves that you can make money on, obviously. So one of the things that factors into that is not only is the feeder calf price, but also what is your feed to gain. You know, how much, how much gain can you put on your cattle? How many pounds of feed for every pound that they get on? Um, how much is that going to take? So as an example, typically Holsteins are going to be running in that 7 to 1 range. Um, some of the projections on the 15 year history that I have on this farm um, are going to be exceeded by the first cattle that are going to be run through my new Summit Monoslope barn. Uh, the, the group of steers that I've got right behind me, um, they are sold for February delivery to the packer. Uh, today they weigh right at 1,320 pounds. We just weighed some this last weekend. I would have targeted those cattle to probably be 100 pounds less than that uh, whenever I bought them back in March of this last year as lightweight 400-pound uh, feeders. Um, I expect that they're going to be ready in January, maybe even December, and they're going to be heavier than what I expected them expected that they would be. So, so from a both from a from a feed efficiency standpoint, because I know how many pounds of feed that I feed them every day, we keep track of that. We enter that into a spreadsheet, so we know what their feed to gain is. I know that they're ahead of schedule. I also know that they're ahead of schedule from an average daily gain standpoint, because they're going to be ready at least 30 days sooner than I thought they would be. If you really tie some of those things together, then what is what is that monoslope building? What did it do for me? Um, if my average daily gain was better, if my feed to feed to gain ratio was better than what it had been in the past, those are more profitable cattle. Uh, so it either changes your numbers, you know, whenever you decide in what you can't afford to pay for feeder calves when you're first trying to buy them, is you know, when you can plug in lower numbers on those two key areas that I talked about before, that helps out on, on deciding what kind of cattle you can buy, what cattle you can't afford to buy, but more importantly, it just makes things more profitable here at our farm. Um, if we are used to turning Holsteins every nine or ten months and now we can turn them every eight or nine, that's another, you know, maybe another group of steers that we could raise every year that we didn't before because they were in this barn. So we're, we're excited about it. Uh, we've been in a barn for just a little bit less than a year right now. Uh, the cattle are performing great and uh, looking for great things out of this building.